All right, so hi everyone. My name is Noka Thomas and I'm a manager of diversity um, and I sit in the New York office. Um, I am very fortunate to uh, be able to introduce Sylvia Ann Hewlett, who's here today speaking about her recently published book, uh, Forget a Mentor, Find a Sponsor. Um, so just quickly uh, what the run of show is going to be. We're going to have uh, Sylvia come up and she's going to introduce us to this distinction between mentorship and sponsorship and tell you how sponsorship may be your fastest ticket to the top. Following her presentation, we're going to do a very brief Q&A for about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, so in terms of introduction, just very quickly, um, Sylvia is an economist and founder and CEO of a New York-based think tank called the Center for Talent Innovation. Um, she's found, she founded and chaired a task force for talent innovation for 75 multinational companies, of which Google is one, that are focused on fully realizing the, global the, the new streams of talent in the global marketplace. Um, Sylvia is author of 10 Harvard Business Review articles and 10 critically acclaimed books, including Off Ramps and On Ramps, uh, as well as When the Bow Breaks. Uh, she's no stranger to Google. She's a longtime partner and has been here many times before. So today she is back by popular demand. Sylvia. Well, it is fabulous to be back. And uh, I want to begin today with um, a little bit about my own personal journey because I think I bring a particular passion to this work because it so much resonates to my own life. So uh, I grew up in the Welsh mining valleys, a very neglected and rather bleak part of the UK. In fact, when I was growing up, um, the local unemployment rate was 38%. Uh, the coal mines were closing down. And I was a part of a working class family. There were six daughters. Uh, I spent a lot of my childhood uh, praying for the boy because my working class bloke of a rather wonderful father desperately wanted a son. So when my mom was 45 years old and gave birth to her sixth daughter, she officially gave up. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad um, decided he better do something with his girls. Um, you know, the most you could do as a girl child in the Welsh mining valleys was marry an unemployed miner. Uh, so, you know, not too appealing in lots of ways. So what he did when I was 13 is he took me by bus uh, to Cambridge University. And he basically saw me, I think, as a young person with some promise. And he knew what young people of promise needed was a dream. So he showed me what he had heard. <laughs> was one of the most beautiful and opportunity-packed campuses in Europe. And he just said to me, he said, you know, if you work hard, you can go here. It was a very audacious challenge because, you know, I went to a very lousy school, <laughs> which had been in existence for 200 years and no one had ever been to either Oxford or Cambridge. You know, so why should I be different? But he had in the back of his mind a sense that times were changing. Uh, a women's movement was getting off the ground, and there was a Labour government in power which was forcing the ancient, ancient universities to open their doors much more widely to some different folks, right? In particular, girls and kids from the wrong side of the tracks. And I certainly got to qualify on both those scores. So I did go back to Wales. Obviously, I worked like crazy. Uh, I was very motivated. But quite frankly, I would not have gotten into that university had it not been for the change of the rules, the attitudes, and the culture. And I think what I learned from that is that really no one, uh, no matter how promising, really pulls themselves up by their own bootstraps. We all need kind of heavy duty lifting from outside. And this task force I founded 10 years ago, which now has 75 companies, and it's wonderful to be working with Google, is really about fully realizing the talents of kind of all the new kids on the block. You know, women, multicultural folks, gay individuals, folks from emerging markets, Gen Ys. Because many of us have different value propositions. Uh, we have different things that incentivize us, et cetera, et cetera. And we cannot any longer work with an old paradigm. So let me share with you uh, this particular piece of work. We've done some amazing work. We did a whole study, for instance, on extreme jobs. 
How do you make them sustainable? What is an extreme job? We did a huge study last year on what we call the power of out. What happens when gay individuals can claim their full identity at work? And in Silicon Valley, only 43% of gay professionals are actually out in the workplace. A rather staggering thought. So we look at the talent issues you know, right across the gamut. So what drew us to this work, uh, and this is the task force. We have some extraordinary members. It's very global. Uh, we see the talent conversation as a global conversation, not an American conversation. So we have, you know, Jen Pack, and we have uh, Schlumberger. Uh, we have all kinds of players. <laughs> a recent addition, which is a strange addition, some of the multilateral institutions are joining us. The IMF, for instance, which desperately needs to diversify. <laughs> and the CIA. Uh, we're not quite sure why the CIA joined. Uh, it's all classified. Uh, but we suspect that they know that if they're going to be effective in this world, they better do a better job at reflecting the face of their mission and sending a bunch of, you know, 50-year-old pale males <laughs> to some of the arenas that they're in as leaders ain't going to work. So they're trying to learn from the private sector, which is fascinating. And actually, the numbers show <laughs> that the private sector is doing better than the public sector uh, in all kinds of ways in terms of these talent changes. So these are some of the companies that underwrote this particular piece of work. And what I'm going to start with here is the challenge behind this piece of work on sponsorship. So here's the deal. <laughs> There's been enormous progress in the lower and middle rungs of career ladders. But life at the top hasn't changed much at all. For instance, you know, one figure I kind of feel is indicative of it all, only 8% of the top earners in this economy are female. That figure was precisely the same 15 years ago. So there's been all this change in what I call the marzipan layer, that rich but very sticky layer you know, below the top, but not a whole lot of change at the top. And people of color are also stuck and stalled at the middle levels. So what we did was try and figure out how people got to the top. And it's about how power is transferred in the workplace. And basically, what has happened through time, and you know, we're not newly discovering this, we're just newly quantifying it. Uh, senior leaders have replicated themselves. They've tapped on the shoulder someone in the next level down who they feel most comfortable with. Uh, whether you know, they went to the same school, they behave the same, they uh, maybe go to the same church or synagogue. There is a comfort zone. Leadership replicates itself. So the idea is to actually describe what's going on and make it more accessible to folks who didn't necessarily come from sponsor-rich environments. You know, folks like me, you know, there weren't too many leaders uh, in those valleys I grew up in. So in our data, we find that there are three things a sponsor does that really distinguishes this person from a mentor, an old style mentor. First off, the leader really needs to know you, needs to understand your value and be willing to take a bet on you. Because you know, you'll be walking around with their, your, their brand on your forehead. So you've got to be able to uh, you know, grow this as an organic, uh, work-driven relationship. It's got to be real. Secondly, that person who is uh, almost by definition a more senior person in the organization needs to publicly advocate for that next position, for that, that next stretch opportunity, so that you can you know, show your promise to the world. And finally, they have to be in your corner so you can take some risks. Because nothing gets done that's amazing in the workplace without a great deal of risk and therefore failure. It's often said, for instance, that um, people of color are risk, risk adverse at work. We find that that's not true. They're merely not suicidal. <laughs> so few of them have sponsors. So few of them have a senior person that has their back that it's actually very dangerous to take a risk. 
So that's the third thing that a sponsor does that is extremely important in terms of your traction. Now, the stuff on the right is stuff that uh, sponsors do, but mentors often do too. The guidance, the contacts, the advice. I mean, that's something that has always uh, been on offer in progressive companies. Turning to the other side of the equation, one of the big distinguishing uh, realities about the sponsorship relationship is that it's deeply reciprocal. You almost have to give before you get. In other words, you need to earn sponsorship. How do you do it? What makes it very likely that you are the person who will get tapped on the shoulder for this opportunity? Well, again, there, in the data, there are three things. First off, performance, of course. That's central. Trustworthiness, loyalty to the team, to the leader. Because no one is going to take a bet on you unless you're incredibly reliable. Thirdly, you better have some currency that makes you create value added, something that the leader does not have, something that the team does not have. I mean, it could be cultural fluency. It could be uh, amazing knowledge of, I don't know, the New Jersey market, <laughs> or a third language, or, you know, name it, it's out there. Figuring out your currency lifting it up, shouting it from the rooftops, making it apparent what's additive, what's unique about your contribution, enormously powerful in terms of making you indispensable to leaders. So what we're describing here is you know, something which is very profoundly a two-way street. And this, of course, is very different from mentoring because you know, traditional mentoring is a very passive thing. I mean, what does a mentee do? I mean, they sit, they smile, they say thank you, uh, they take some notes perhaps, make an appointment for coffee in two months, but you don't have skin in the game. It, it's something that's being given to you. It's paying it forward. And probably we all do it, you know, whether it's, you know, interns that, you know, are in the office for the summer. In my case, you know, I've got endless students that <laughs> uh, I have mentored over the years. What we find is that when there is confusion as to what is mentoring and what is sponsorship, you can get the balance wrong in your life. For instance, we find that women and people of color over mentor. It's very easy to have 17 people that you're mentoring because there is such a yearning for that kind of support. But unless you're also sponsoring two or three people who are fabulous, and really delivering for you, you stall out. We find leaders who sponsor well are much more likely to get the next, more senior slot. It propels them forward. People who become isolated and don't sponsor, don't have this kind of powerful posse of younger folks, you know, shoving and pushing and helping you. So what we say about this research is that at any point in your career, you should be do doing both things. Seeking to refresh your sponsors, to get yourself to the next level, and proactively investing in just two or three people on your team, perhaps, who you value particularly, and you have very high expectations of in terms of what they deliver for you. And then, obviously, the pay it forward and the gift of mentoring, you can also do, but not exclusively. So I want to just tell one story about why it's important to sponsor, really from a pretty early age in the workplace. One of the powerful interviews I did for this book was with a, uh, the head of an engineering firm on the East Coast. So he said, you know, I totally get this sponsoring thing. When I interview people, who have gone through the whole selection process and are being considered as one of my direct reports. I always add, ask this key question, which is, how many people do you have in your pocket? Meaning, how many people have you sponsored over the years and are now dotted around this company in key positions? So if I asked you to do something totally impossible next week, which involved liaising across three geographies and five functions, 
you could actually deliver. Because there are folks out there who owe you one and think you're fabulous and will put your project first. And he said, you know, I'm not interested in anyone who doesn't have deep pockets. And these days, given our global span and the face of our consumer, they better be deep, diverse pockets. And of course, we might not choose that language, <laughs> but it is a deeply productive alliance with a senior person. This is not meant to be a burden, right, on anyone, and it's muscles that we need to develop and flex if we are going to be successful. Okay, so let's look at the data. The data rests on four different surveys, representative samples of middle level and uh, senior executives across this economy. We also did a ton of online focus groups, which were anonymous, and a lot of interviews. So, you know, if you look across the economy, <coughs> obviously, not everyone will get sponsors <coughs> because it is the leadership track. It is the fast track. So, 19% of, you know, uh, men in general get sponsorship. The thing is that men, particularly white men, are much more likely to have this relationship at work than women or people of color. The gap on the uh, ethnic background front is particularly wide. Uh, as you can see, Caucasians 63% more likely to have a sponsor. And we find that the stick lay here. Remember that second thing that goes on, this trust, this reliability, this loyalty thing? It seems that trust, the sense that you can really uh, totally rely on this person to come through for you, doesn't cross lines of gender or race very readily. It has to be something that is learned, that is a goal, is something that's sought after. Because the natural tendency is a mini-me thing. You select and groom for leadership someone who is in your prime comfort zone. OK, so we're looking at uh, what sponsors do in terms of our data. We find that this is pretty dramatic data. Men and women with sponsors, much more likely to ask for and get a pay raise. Well, why not? There's someone on that committee, right, deciding on bonuses <laughs> or pay grades who is speaking up for you. Secondly. Men and women with the sponsors much more likely to stick around. And again, why not? There's someone who's giving you career opportunities, who's telling you that you're, uh, you've got what it takes, that you're valuable to the company, et cetera, et cetera. But think of this figure. Women who've just had a child are 38% more likely to both come back to work and stay back at work if they have a sponsor. So the impact is huge. And then it impacts ambition. And we find, for instance, the 35-year-olds, 38-year-olds do not downsize their dreams if they're sponsored. They're able to sustain their ambition through midlife. Because again, there's traction. They can see that there's you know, a pathway where they are advancing with really important folks on their side. And finally, the progression figures are extremely clear. Men and women with sponsors. And remember, in this data, we're using the definition that I shared with you. And it is this rather rigorous definition of what this senior person is doing for you and what you're doing for them. But right across the board, there's a huge impact of sponsorship on whether you get to the next rung on the ladder. OK, let's talk about some of the tripwires, because obviously it's not a coincidence uh, <laughs> that a particularly women and uh, multicultural folks somehow miss out on this relationship. So let's talk about the first tripwire. Again, leaders often tell us in the research they find it hard to choose a woman. 
because somehow she is not seen as a potential leader. She isn't seen as leadership material. And there's all this silly stuff going on. <laughs> In other words, there's this very narrow window of what is deemed acceptable in uh, the leadership model. So it's awfully easy for a woman to be seen as too opinionated, too bossy, uh, the B word comes out, or she's seen as too quiet, too retiring, too passive. Just a little window where she's just right. Uh, and we find that if, if a man is quiet, um, He's seen as a still waters run deep type, you know, all kinds of stuff going on in there. He's just not sharing. Um, a woman is just seen as probably, you know, um, just not up to snuff. Undress, too provocative, too frumpy. I had a CEO uh, give me a whole lecture about the frump factor at his, uh, in his company and how distressing it was to him. <laughs> Too aggrandizing, we can be too show-offy, you know, we are too pushy, or we're too self-depreciating. And then the one I love, we're too young, or we're too old. There's three years in there when we're just right. <laughs> Men get 17 years. So I'll tell you what the three years are afterwards. Um, but you know, more seriously, and you know, I think what that data, and I wish I could say it was old data, it's not old data, it's like a year ago. Uh, what it shows is the need, and probably Google's rather good at this, expanding our vision of what leaders looked like, talked like, and behaved like. Because to use those kinds of you know, scre implicit screening devices is a ridiculous notion. Because obviously it has so little to do with the uh, performance or the contribution of, of individuals. But this is distressing. You know, 35% of African-American individuals are in the middle levels of their uh, companies feel that it is impossible to get to the top. And it has a huge impact on behavior because we find, and this is a real figure, 43% of very high potential valued you know, long track record, African American individuals at age 40-ish leave for entrepreneurial activities. They do not stay in corporations because of that. They assume that they're on a slow road to nowhere. Okay, so what we have done, and this is very much what the book's about, you know, you don't need a program or some massive, massive initiative. I mean, companies can help by creating a culture of sponsorship, perhaps by helping you create pathways to sponsorship. But it's also true that as an individual, you know, you can go make this happen for yourself. So there is a journey, there are tactics, there are things you have to, you know, uh, have centrally in your mind. And one thing I do want to just point out is that we absolutely need to be operating on both sides of this equation all the time. So let me uh, pick out a couple of these things because you know you do have the book, so all of it's there. First off, as you figure out which of the kind of power brokers in your life <laughs> might be the one to get in front of and impress the hell out of, <laughs> you can't make that decision until you know where you're going. So. Uh, creating this uh, vision of the kind of agency impact and influence and position that you might ultimately want is a pretty important exercise. And you know, one story which I love, which you know, stuck in my mind, when Walt Disney uh, built that amazing theme park in Florida all those years ago, I think it was 1967, he knew he had to build the castle first because that's where the magic is. So that's what he did. There was this medieval <coughs> fantasy castle with the turrets and the flags. And for the 30,000 workers who were grappling with the mangrove swamps and trying to build those tunnels and lakes and all the rest of it, it was pretty amazing to know what they were building and this kind of paradise for kids that it was going to be. 
And it was a huge reason for why engagement was incredibly high, and that project was delivered on time, on budget. So build your castle first. You know, career journeys are full of difficult chunks of time to maintain uh, one's motivation, one's, I guess, focus, one's drive, one's vision. It's pretty important to be able to embrace and touch and almost smell, you know, the, the role <laughs> that you ultimately want. So I just want to pick out a couple of things. When you scan the horizon for you know, some possible sponsors, there's some classic mistakes people make. You do not need to look for someone who looks like you <laughs> or acts like you. We find one thing that is very true, particularly of women, is that they seek out um, collaborative leaders, uh, leaders that are inclusive, uh, leaders that uh, value uh, pushback, all that kind of stuff, and they love it if that leader also happens to be a woman. But what do you imagine you need in a sponsor? Because you can find role models, you can find mentors, right? What do you really, really need in a sponsor? Does any of that stuff matter? Does it matter? No. No? What we say is that you need someone who has a voice on the decision-making table that affects you going down the line, right? You need someone who has the power to make a difference in your career. Now, you need to respect that person. You need to think that they are amazingly good at what they do. <laughs> but you don't need to like them. <laughs> you probably have to you know, understand that they have integrity. But this is a <coughs> transactional relationship. Uh, as one key leader told me, he said, you know, I don't do empathy. <laughs> you know, that's what these other relationships are for. You know, find a friend or a mentor. You know, uh, don't confuse these two things. Because when we do this research, we find that many women are looking for this particular personality that they can super relate to, uh, who's married with kids. So you got your pool down to about 1% of leaders. You know, in other words, you're so restricting you know, the potential uh, candidates for this. So, you know, see it as a, an alliance where you totally um, join uh, missions, if you like, and you both forge ahead. Don't treat it as something that's, you know, uh, full of, um, as I said, empathy. Let me also just emphasize the last thing on this list, uh, leading with a yes. And, and maybe this is so obvious in the Google environment, but we found again one thing that sponsors totally require is this kind of gung-ho um, leaping of opportunities kind of attitude. And again, a little story. A, a CFO who I uh, spent a lot of time with in interviews for this book he was trying to figure out who to throw his weight behind, as he put it, in terms of selecting the person who would take over his role. Uh, he was retiring. And there were nine finalists, because there always are you know, a lot of candidates, uh, whether it's official or unofficial, for any uh, sought after position. And the one he really felt he uh, wanted to support was the only woman on the list. Uh, he knew her well, he'd sponsored her. But for this particular position, because it was a big leap for her, he wasn't sure she was hungry enough. So he gave her a test. Uh, he walked into her office one Monday morning and said, you know, Janet, do I have an opportunity for you? I need someone to go to Omaha for six weeks and troubleshoot this client. The whole thing is falling to pieces, we're losing a lot of money, etc. Take a team in and fix it. So Janet looked up from her desk and said, fantastic. When do I stop? Now the next morning, she remembered she had a one-year-old and a few other clients, you know, a few other uh, responsibilities in life. And she went back and she renegotiated the terms. She was still white hot. 
She still totally felt she could do it and was going to do it. It was not that she was going back with second thoughts. But she said, look, let me go in for four-day spurts. You know, I've got all these other things going on. I'll put my number two there. You know, we'll, we'll handle it. And he was thrilled because he said, actually, that's what anyone would have done. No one worth their salt can really go to Omaha for six weeks. You know, you better have some other important things in your life. Uh, and it would be, you know, what anyone would do who was really an A candidate. But he said so many women in his experience would lead with ambivalence, would be way too honest about how they couldn't do it perfectly. They would wring their hands uh, and talk about the one-year-old and stuff like that. He said, <coughs> bad idea. If you have ambivalence, share it with your mentor. Your sponsor needs to understand that you want this. So, you know, again, some uh, lessons. I mean, the number of mistakes I've made in my career are legion. Uh, I wish I'd had this data when I was 30. Um, the roadmap for sponsors is, is kind of fascinating because it has a lot to do with profoundly understanding what's in it for you. And, you know, one thing we find, and this is very tricky, Asian Americans, women, people from other countries, oftentimes don't sponsor at all. Why do you imagine they don't sponsor? Because they have good sponsors. Pardon? They, have they, ha they don't kind of understand the game in a way, right? But they feel that uh, it's sticking their neck out. And who would they sponsor? If they sponsored someone like them, that would be risky, they think that there would be such scrutiny. You know, a, a Brazilian uh, sponsoring a Brazilian, uh, or a woman uh, sponsoring another woman in a, in a small team, you know. So they shrink from doing that. And yet that is the thing that they would like to do. And oftentimes they don't sponsor anyone. So there were lots of stories of heartache as they turned away from sponsorship. And it's one reason why they tend to over-mentor, because that is very you know, risk-free. But it does mean that they dissipate you know, a lot of energy, because you know, no one should have 27 mentees. You know, it's a kind of silly thing to do. It's, it really undermines your own power if you are giving that kind of time. <laughs> so um, you know, again, you know, there is a, a huge learning in, <coughs> so those who have Proteges, you know, again, much more likely to progress. So there's just one last thing I want to share before opening it up to questions. A piece of work that we uh, have just finished is called Innovation, Diversity, and Market Growth. Uh, it's coming out in the HBO next month. Uh, it's a huge study of 14 sectors, 40 case examples, all kinds of data. What we are able to do in this new work is show precisely how the power of difference on teams unlocks innovation and drives growth. So let me just go into it a little bit, because it's why we need to care right, about why we should progress a fair representation of individuals who cover the <coughs> spectrum of difference in terms of identity, in terms of experience, in terms of perspective. So at the core of this work, we look very hard at diversity. What is it? We discover there are two kinds that really matter when it comes to innovation. First off, you need a certain amount of inherent diversity. By inherent, I mean baked in, you know, the stuff you're born with. Uh, you're a woman or a man, your, uh, your sexual identity is a certain way, etc. Or you grew up in, <laughs> as an Asian person, you know, etc., etc. We have eight dimensions of diversity that are inherent, that are immutable. And you need at least some of that around the table, because otherwise you do not see certain market opportunities, that there is not a visceral connect 
to unmet needs, to unexplored opportunities uh, uh, in the market. But in addition to that, you need what we call acquired diversity, which is a bunch of behaviors that create a speak up culture, make it safe to put out of the box ideas that maybe the leaders are incredibly unfamiliar with, right, on the table. Because obviously, if you come from a very different background or got a very different disciplinary or skill set, you know, you are putting stuff on the table that is not familiar to leaders. So these attributes of acquired diversity, and there are five behaviors that particularly count, are the other ingredient. So the fabulous thing is that you know, companies that have both things going on, both the inherent diversity and the acquired diversity, really do unlock market share and market growth uh, because they are much better at innovation. It's the kind of talent conditions, if you like, for innovation to happen. And then the vast majority of companies don't have one or the other. Maybe both. <laughs> but you know, one doesn't do it. Because you can have a team that's most, you know, impressively diverse. But if you have a command and control bully culture, all of that's going to remain latent. It does not uh, express itself. So, you know, uh, this new study, go to my website. You know, it's all very available. It was published um, last month. Uh, it is a fantastic uh, study, I think, in terms of why we need to care, uh, in terms of uh, creating the kind of, you know, wonderful diversity that we have in this room <laughs> around the leadership tables of this country. So I'll leave it at that, um, and I would love to take some questions. It does. You know, um, I guess I'm going wider than that. You know, obviously, uh, individuals who are in management roles should be particularly uh, self-aware on this front and understand the power of both looking up and looking down and making sure you have these uh, vital relationships. But it's certainly not limited to managers. <laughs> it's the way uh, to forge success. Uh, and it's true for entrepreneurs, too, because you know what do entrepreneurs need? They need power brokers. They need finance, right? They need people to uh, believe in their ideas. They need people to back them, you know? Uh, it, it's true of life. Um, you know, one thing that um, I feel very strongly is, you know, what I learned from this research, because, you know, obviously I'm at a point in life where I'm not necessarily climbing a ladder anymore. So this is how it changed my behavior, this research. First off, it made me very mindful of sponsoring very deliberately two or three particularly outstanding younger people and not over-mentoring, which is kind of a danger in my life. I mean, I'm a professor in my spare time, and the number of folks who want me to write them recommendations and you know that kind of thing. And I certainly do a certain amount of it. But what I found was that I was not making the deliberate investments in younger people who could contribute enormously to my agency and my influence. But the other thing I learned is that I figured that I needed my next castle. You know, you always need your next castle, unless you're 85 and really checking out, right? Um, so what was my next castle? So I thought about that, and I realized I had another castle. And I wanted to have more um, influence in public policy. It was a place I'd started. It matters to me. I'd just done this amazing work with the private sector. And I wanted to have more influence. So I dusted off my Rolodex or you know, my contact list, whatever. And I looked for who I knew in Washington who could open doors. I, I was looking for a new kind of sponsor. 
So I realized I knew someone, you know, from 13 years ago who is currently head of the Council of the Economic Advisors, someone called Alan Kruger. And I called him. I did a bunch of homework, and I learned from my own research how to approach this. So I called up Alan, and I said, Alan, how can I help you? Can I deliver some value? I know you're doing X, Y, and Z, and I have this work, and this is what I could do for you. He nearly fell off his seat, right? He was so thrilled that, you know, most calls from old friends are really asking for favors. So don't do that. Figure out what you can give that is valuable. <coughs> and so I did do a bunch of stuff for him. And sponsorship flowed. He opened a whole bunch of doors. I ended up, you know, on an advisory committee. I got what I, in the end, really wanted out of this relationship. I mean, not that I you know, um, begrudge the stuff I was doing for him. But I learned so much from this research in terms of as a, a protege in this situation, how to make that happen. So, you know, there is something magical about just the, the mindset, uh, which is not just limited to managers. Well, you know, that's what the roadmap really is all about. And uh, there are also a bunch of tactics how you get in front of folks, right? Because that is an issue because you can be all ready with the most extraordinary stream of value, but, you know, how do you get to first base kind of thing? So, you know, there are various tactics. In, in many uh, organizations, you can ask for a mentor. And be careful and clever in terms of who you ask for because that's seen as a pretty light-fingered, easy kind of thing to do. And then turn it into sponsorship, you know, by using uh, a very deliberate intentional strategy uh, of vesting energies. Um, another thing which really works is that uh, if there's professional associations or ERGs or even local not-for-profit boards that many of your leaders are involved in, do some major piece of investing in your community. And that's a very good way to showcase your emerging, you know, leaderly kind of qualities and to get to know some much more senior folks as peers. And again, you can't fake it. You have to choose something you're genuinely interested in <laughs> because it makes no sense otherwise. But uh, again, if we look at the strategies that um, pay off, you know, uh, the book is full of them. Uh, there are some very simple things that uh, can bring off the connection, the initial connection. You certainly should not turn up at someone's office that you don't know and say, will you sponsor me? I mean, that is not going to work because they have to believe in you because they're taking a risk and they have skin in the game. And, you know, I think most white leaders, uh, white male leaders, are not trying to avoid you. It's just that uh, in their line of sight, you know, uh, it's easier to make the choices that they typically have done in the past. Much of it's subliminal. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> Especially, I think, on this campus. <laughs> Well, you know, across the economy, it's 38 to 41. Yeah, you've got a lot, you know, you've got a big runway in front of you. 